Welcome to the Ocean Shores City Council election debates. I'm Angelo Bruscus for North Beach Community TV and NorthBeachNow.com here at the Ocean Shores Lions Club, where tonight we have the first of three debates featuring city council candidates. Tonight's debate features the candidates for position number one, Susan Canari and Eric Noble. Both are current council members running against each other in this race. Uh, the events this, this evening are co-sponsored by the North Beach Senior Center and the North Beach uh, Ocean Shores Lions Club. The next debate will be September 29th at 6 p.m. with candidates Rich Hartman and Patrick Hayes. And then a final debate will be October 6th, both of those at 6 p.m. with Lisa Scott and Patrick Doherty. Let's go inside and see the first of the debates between Eric Noble and Susan Canari. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for attending tonight's event. Would everyone please welcome Susan Canari and Eric Noble. All right, since both are currently sitting council members, it has been decided that rather than this be a traditional debate structure, I will be asking specific questions for them to answer. These questions were once submitted by the public and agreed upon by the committee overseeing this event. Each candidate will have five minutes opening and five minutes closing statement, with three minutes each to answer a question. A warning bell will be sounded, indicating 30 seconds left to finish up. Oh, bell. There you go. We're doing that old school, by the way. <laughs> if the situation warrants a rebuttal, I will, at my discretion, allow one to happen. The key word in that sentence is my discretion. There are also questionnaire cards to fill out over to the left, which will be given to the candidates for them to answer directly to you. <clears throat> I ask that there be no applause, any remarks, negative or positive, to be said during the event and definitely no tomato throwing because I'm the one that has to clean this place. Please be respectful to both candidates and those in attendance. If anyone deviates from this request, you'll be asked to leave the event immediately. There are plain clothes security on standby. If you can point them out, I'll give you 20 bucks. Again, please, let's hear <laughs> let's hear what they have to say and be respectful to everyone here. Thank you, and let's get started. Okay, question number one. Five minutes. Sir. Five minutes. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> Take that question down. All right, uh, five minutes each. Uh, Susan, can you start? Ladies first. I'll start. She, she asked me to. Eric, will you start? <laughs> Ladies first. <laughs> so, um, again, my name is Eric Noble. I think uh, quite a few of you know me, but for those of you who don't, I'll just give a short background. Um, I grew up in the Midwest, uh, actually lived in Minnesota and then Wisconsin for quite a while. Go Pack Go, and we're happy about Monday night. Um, I graduated from the University of Northwestern up in St. Paul with a uh, degree in education. Um, it was interesting, I met my wife my senior year and we got married and instead of going into education I became a builder up in northern Wisconsin for a few years. Um, in 1996 we moved down to southeastern Wisconsin and I became the uh, maintenance manager at a large Salvation Army conference center there um, and worked there for almost 11 years. In 2002, I became the executive director of that um, conference center. It was a fairly large conference center. We had a staff in the summer of over 100 people and our budget was about $8 million. So for the 10 years I was there, um, we worked with a lot of organizations, a lot of um, um, donation of uh, nonprofit organizations, a lot of the government organizations, the county. We had to do a lot of stuff at that place for a long time. Um, in, 
2011, um, I moved to California and took a job as, at a conference center there with a little different organization. Um, worked there for five years as the assistant director and then the executive director. In 2012, I decided to, actually 2011, change careers and I started working for Wyndham Destinations, which is a timeshare company. Um, moved to San Luis Obispo as the assistant director, as assistant manager, and then in 2014, moved up here to Ocean Shores and I presently the general manager of the World Mark down by the jetty. Um, in my over 27 years of management, I've had to oversee multi-million dollar budgets, uh, multiple staff, multiple associates, uh, multiple organizations. Uh, we've had many, many renovations of anywhere from a few thousand dollars to multi-million dollar renovations. And everywhere I've worked, everywhere I've lived, everywhere I've tried to go, I've always tried to make it a better place. Um, whether that's financially more stable, whether that's um, working with the people, working with the governments, working with whatever, whatever it is, I've always focused on trying to make that a better place and a better organization. I, I've tried to do that with the uh, resort I work at now, with the company I work for now, and that's why I'm here running for Ocean Shores, because in whatever capacity I can, I just want to make it a better place for everybody. Thank you, Eric. Susan. I am Susan Canari, incumbent candidate for city council position number one. My previous experience, small business owner, CEO of a nonprofit educational organization, 40 years of community service, elected to the governing board of Lakeside Fire Protection District 2010 to 2014. Ocean Shores Planning Commission, Grays Harbor Board of Equalization, local elected rep for the O3A Advisory Council, <laughs> volunteer for Grays Harbor Medical Reserve Corps, member of the Ocean Shores Hotel Coalition, organizer of town halls and weekly community forums. Elected to City Council in 2017, I was voted into office to do a job, to work collaboratively with you to spend taxpayer money wisely. My plan running for re-election was to stay focused on our priorities, but this campaign has taken a serious detour. You've seen them everywhere, designed to distract and sway public opinion, to interfere with and attempt to change the course of the election. This campaign season has been filled with red herrings. First red herring called out that I was responsible for the rebound investigation into the city-owned golf course. The rumor was stopped when the author of the report <coughs> said it was not me. Then, at this year's Flag Day Parade, a dozen or more golf carts displayed signs that the golf course was under attack and needed to be saved. From what? The fictional tale was that I had plans to sell the course and develop low-income housing. Another falsehood. But when folks lost interest in saving the golf course, it was time for new red herrings. These red herrings popped up again as anonymous people placed packets illegally in people's mailboxes without postage. They were also handed out at the golf course. The packets contained false and misleading statements about me, about a neighbor dispute and a bankruptcy. Keep in mind that nowhere in the packets did they mention that the court case was nine years ago, nor did they mention, in exchange for us dismissing our appeal, a settlement agreement was reached and satisfaction of judgment filed in 2016. They purposely chose not to tell the whole story. They took to cyberbullying on social media, asking you to look up my convictions and adding they are, quote, not pretty. In fact, there are no convictions in a civil case. Despite the negativity in the campaign against me, I continued to focus on the needs of our entire community. Health and safety, food insecurities, businesses without staff because the workers have nowhere to live. Lot clearing and the lack of enforcement of our ordinances. Scrutinizing new ordinances to be sure they are legally sound. The taxpayers of this community cannot withstand losing another lawsuit. My opponent has publicly stated that he will collaborate with the mayor. Me, 
Not necessarily. Not if it means voting against your wishes. Nothing that comes to us for approval should be rubber stamped. Council members are elected to serve you, not the mayor. For four years, my motives on city council have been simple, and that's why many people miss them altogether. Bringing decades of experience helping people with all sorts of problems and issues, I am a per people person. I do care about people. I listen to those I serve, and when I speak, you know you are hearing well-formed ideas. My opponent initially told people he wasn't running again. Then he filed for my seat. When asked why, his answer was, quote, she talks too much and asks too many questions. I believe it scares my opponent and others because they are afraid of what people really want. They do not take the time to listen. They vote the way the mayor asks with no thought as to how public policy impacts the lives of those we are sworn to serve. This election is not about an imaginary attack on the golf course. It's not about a neighbor dispute that was settled years ago. It's about people, our needs, health and safety. It's about quality of life and our environment. Living lightly on this planet so we can leave some green space for our great grandkids. It's about making sure the toilets flush and fresh water runs from the tap. It's about a sound economic future and properly managing our growth. It's about supporting our recreational activities. It's about spending taxpayers' money wisely. It's about you and me <coughs> trusting each other. Bell we know the bell ring. Just don't worry about it. We're handling it. If you have an issue, you may leave. Okay? I've already stated that. Go ahead. I'm just going to run my last paragraph again, if you don't mind. It's about making sure the toilets flush and fresh water runs from the tap. It's about a sound economic future and properly managing our growth. It's about supporting our recreational activities. It's about spending taxpayers' money wisely. It's about you and me trusting each other making the right choices for the future of Ocean Shores. My name is Susan Canari, and I am running for re-election for council position number one. Thank you for being here this evening, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, That's you. Quite funny. Thank you, Susan. Question number one. Yeah. Question number one. Seven seats on Ocean Shores Council are not geographically related, meaning none represent a particular or specific part of the city. In some other cities, the seats do represent specific geographic areas. Given the changing de ge ge demographics of the, our city, do you think we should continue this form of representation or align, align the seats with specific areas? Why or why not? And do you believe this affects this current election. Susan, you're first. Thank you. I think I'll start with the last part. How does this affect this current election? I don't believe it does because we haven't changed anything yet. Um, this has come up on numerous occasions that the seats should represent a, a ward or a district. And I think the problem that we would have in Ocean Shore is to change it is where I live now, would that be the area that I would represent? And given the fact that I've been an at-large council member, I think that there are a number of people in Ocean Shores that would have a fit that I wasn't representing them, because I have been representing everybody in this city up to this point. So I think it was something that we wanted to change. It would take a good deal of discussion, but I think the discussion would necessarily come from you not from council members making a change. It would be something that you would decide. And we have not quite the same as we do in some of the big cities, where you say, we've got big houses on the hill, or we've got the apartment complexes over here. Everything is mixed up together. So I think that it would be a difficult thing for us to say, let's pick one council member and let them represent a certain area. It will be up to you to come and say that this is something you'd want us to change. I think that's it. I did the last one first. Thank you. Thank you. Eric. 
Yeah, I actually pretty much agree with most of that. I, we haven't talked about it. Um, I've only I've been on the council three years and watched it for um, four years before that and tried to understand why it, it seems a little odd to just, you know, you have seven people and everybody votes for the seven people. Uh, but looking into it, I, I agree with Susan that, you know, it would be difficult in this town. It's a, not a very big town, so those boards would be pretty small. Um, not saying that it couldn't happen, but I would definitely do the same thing. I would put it out to a poll. Um, I don't know that it would make much difference one way or another. I mean, maybe for some areas they might feel better having a uh, more focused person, but, you know, as it is now, everybody has access to all seven of us if they choose to do that, so um, I don't think that that's a bad thing. Uh, it, you know, you have a much broader range of people that you might agree with or not agree with, so um, I would leave it up to the citizens also put it out to a poll if that's what we want to change. There's a number of different ways to do it, but I think it would be difficult, and I don't know that our system at this point doesn't work. So. By the way, that was the number one question. In the public. Yeah, and I don't, I don't think it affects the current election either. Okay, great, thank you. Question number two. What unique qualities do you have that in your mind make you the best choice for position number one on the city council? What have you learned while on council that makes you the better candidate than the other incumbent? Eric, you're number one. Yeah, I, again, I think, you know, my experience over a, my whole life um, gives me a lot of unique qualities to um, be on the city council. Being on the city council is not an easy job, it's not a fun job, it's not, a lot of times it's not a pleasant job, but what it is, is it's a um, position that you can look at a community and try to make it a better place for the people that are in that community. Um, and again, as I said in my introduction, everywhere I've gone, I've tried to make it a better place. Everywhere I've been, I think I've left the company I was working with a better place than I found it when I got there. Um, I have learned a lot over the years, um, both good and bad. I've had some fairly difficult situations in my life where um, at one point we almost lost most everything and we had to rebuild that. Uh, so I know what it is to not have anything. I know what it is to you know, um, make yourself the best you can be. So I bring a lot of management experience. I brought a lot of, I've been on many, many boards and you need to understand as a board member what board member what your role is. You're, you're an oversight board. You're not a micromanaging person. You don't look at the staff and say, you know, you should be doing the X, Y, and Z. We need to work together for policy, for fiscal um, benefit of the whole city. Um, everywhere I've been, every budget I've managed in 27 years, I have never left a budget that was under budget. I've always fiscally kept every organization I've ever been a part of as sound as I could. So I, that's a huge deal when you're running that city and you have to trust the city staff and the people that are doing the day-to-day -day work to let them do that work. And we have to be careful on the council when you're making decisions, what effect that has on the city staff and are you now changing everything that they're doing. So the unique qualities is I have a lot of board experience over the years. I've learned a lot through um, the experiences I've gone through working with nonprofits, working for for profits, working with organizations, both government, both non government. Um, and I'm at a point in my life where I hope I can continue to learn. Um, what I think is that 30 seconds left? 30 seconds. Yeah, yeah. so why I, I think I'm a better candidate is I have a lot more experience in managing people, managing budgets. I know my opponent says she has done all that. Um, but I don't see, managing people is a tough thing and it's a hard thing and through managing people you understand how best to work with other people, whether they agree with you or not, that's okay. At the end of the day, you've got to make decisions and you've got to move things forward. Thank you, Eric. Susan. Thank you. I first began in my <coughs> career as a citizen activist back in the day. 
And I rallied, or attempted to rally my neighbors because of an issue that was happening in the neighborhood. And everybody was really excited in the beginning, but when we finally ended up going to the city council meetings, I was the only one who went. And I continued to go to council meetings, and I continued to work hard to get a number of things changed. Along the way, I realized that the only way that you could convince the city council to change their mind was to do your homework. And that when you came forward, you better have something that made sense to them. Otherwise, they would just look at you and say you were just emotional or you were whining. And so I quickly learned how to go and find the information that I needed, whether it was traffic reports, impact studies to our schools. And eventually, I was placed on the planning commission. And one of the things I learned there was that, yes, I could be a citizen activist and not want development to take place, but when you're on a planning commission, developers have rights as well. And so you have to learn very quickly that there was a compromise. And it was a matter of finding out what the citizens wanted and being able to explain to them that, yes, these things are perhaps objectionable to you in the beginning, but you have to realize that the developers can't do this. So how do we work this out? How do we make it? work for everyone. And I liked doing that. From there I went on to the Assessment Appeals Board where we dealt with property taxes. And that was really an interesting situation because the rules are such that you can't change them, that you can have a board that can. And we found that very interesting. And again, it had to be based on findings of fact because everything that we ruled on went to Superior Court. Nothing that we ever ruled on was overturned by Superior Court. When I got elected to the city council, I had had elected experience with the fire district, but I'd never been on municipal government. And so I immediately set to educating myself. And I have spent the time, particularly during COVID when we were locked down, to take as much civic education training courses as I could. And I did gain my advanced municipal leadership award incredibly important to me because I need to understand how municipal government works, what my role is, what the mayor's role is, how we work together. Why I am the better candidate? I have spent four years working with you in the community. I have held hundreds of community forums, town halls. I have solicited your input. You are the people that I serve. I cannot make a decision that is a good, good decision, unless I have heard from you and interacted with you. It is something that I'm very proud of doing, and I look forward to continue to do that, so that we, again, we can make the best decisions that we can on the council for the majority of people that live in Ocean Shores. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Question number three. It's a big one of the night. Explain what is happening with the city-owned golf course. What do the signs mean? <coughs> Susan, you're first. Well, as I stated in my opening speech, we were led to believe that there was an attack on the golf course, and there was never an attack on the golf course. There was a report that was sent out to the city council members from a group called Rebound. It was a letter that went to the auditor, and council members were given a copy of that. And in it, it talked about some of the, the way that the city had done their bids, and that they weren't quite the way they should have been done. There were a lot of things that were included in that that led the golf course to think that it was an attack on him. My interpretation of that report was that it was bringing to the attention of the city that their practices were not proper and that they needed to be looked into. It quickly morphed into something that I was responsible for and the reason for that was because I was on the audit committee. Every year the city is audited city council members are allowed to be part of it. And we are asked, is there anything that's gone on this year that you have a concern about that you'd like us to look at? And I was concerned about the golf course bid because when Mr. Zander got the bid, it was much lower than the other bids by a great amount, 150,000, I believe. And when I asked the mayor, she said, well, it's because they're using volunteers. 
And that didn't make sense to me, that you could have a municipal government contract with volunteers. So I did bring it up to the audit company. They came back and they said there was no problem. But in the rebound report, they made mention of the fact that I, my name was there, had asked the question, and apparently it was a good question. And they, in turn, were now asking the state audit to look into it again. When we saw the signs go up, there were many of us that were confused. But as I look at the signs now, it is quite obvious that the manager of the golf course supports three candidates, and that's what those signs are about. He is supporting the three, not the rest of us. And the only other thing that we saw was the Save the Golf Course signs that were on the little golf courts that were tooling around in the Flag Day Parade that were saying that I was going to sell the golf course. And I have to tell you that I'm quite flattered to think that someone thinks that I could actually sell it. <laughs> There's no way that the city is going to sell an asset like the golf course. It's something incredibly important to us. We have all, as a city council, voted to support the course, particularly in the irrigation project. We're ready to do the second phase. So it's really, to me, quite silly that all of this came about. Social media had a great deal to do with it, but I hope that it's all been cleared up now and that everybody understands that the council themselves do support the golf course, as does city administration as well. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Eric, so this is an interesting question. I didn't see this one coming. Um, but if you go to my website, votericnoble.com, I did just blog about this. Um, and I would disagree with my opponent on whether or not there has, been an there has been an attack on Kurt Zander, whether you can equate that with the golf course or not. Kurt Zander, from my perspective, pretty much is the golf course at this time. Um, and as I stated in, I mean, he, he runs a golf course, he leases a golf course. We would not have the same golf course that we have without Kurt Zander because it would be very difficult to run a course like he's doing on the shoestring that he does. And the reason it is, is because he does most of the work himself. He and his wife run that golf course. And they, day in, day out, they are there. They have very few employees that man maintain that golf course. So it was odd when the, at the budget process, um, three of the council members held up the budget for eight weeks so that the, uh, and asked the auditors to audit specifically the golf course, which the auditors thought was very odd. Um, and they hadn't been asked the questions that they were asked by these three council members in all the years they've been auditing Ocean Shores, and they thought that was very strange. And when the audit came back clean, then all of a sudden the rebound report comes out. Um, I actually called Miriam Moses, who wrote the rebound report, and I talked to her for an hour and a half asking, what is this? And when I read the report, the only thing I read when I heard, I got it in my email, I, I called Miriam, I actually called Susan right after I called Miriam, and my perspective was it was all about the golf course and not about the city and what the city had done or not done. Because Kurt Sanders name was mentioned for 24 times in that audit, or in that report. So it would be hard to say that this wasn't about Kurt Sander, and everything that, that was in that report had already been taken care of. Um, L and I had gotten an anonymous call early in the year um, saying that he had done some infractions. L and I investigated. They found two infractions, which one was he wasn't paying his employee weekend prevailing wage rates, which he didn't realize he was supposed to do. And second, he had put an uh, electrical line in a trench with a water pipe um, that he, because he was in a hurry because of the pandemic and was running behind, he did get a fine for that. And I have run a lot of projects and these things happen. It was nothing intentional that Kurt had done. Um, it just doesn't always happen. So after that, um, then somebody anonymously called and after he finished the project and said his pump hadn't been installed right. L and I looked into that, it was fine. A few weeks ago, somebody called and asked Ecology and told them that he had been dumping grass clippings into the canals, which Kurt has never done. There is a continued something going on with somebody and Kurt Zander. So to say that there isn't an attack for Kurt Zander is disingenuous. It has been going on. I didn't. I never blamed Susan. I never said Susan did anything. I actually talked to Susan again for an hour and a half after the rebound report. So there has been something going on, and that's what it is. The support our golf course signs came out. We actually 
uh, promoted them because of the rebound report and what that put Kurt through in the pandemic was horrendous and what he had to deal with for three months and it was going to damage his reputation, damage his business, and potentially damage his relationship with the city. Anybody who knows Kurt Zander in the 30 years he has poured into this city knows he didn't deserve what is continuing to this day. Rebuttal? Uh, I'll allow. Thank you. So Eric is correct. The minute he got the rebound report, he called me. It was not a pleasant conversation. And I suggested that he might want to read the entire thing because what he was saying to me, I did not think he had read it. And then he did indeed call Miriam. And of course, I was called out on being the one who had started this investigation. And rebound had to respond and in writing say that it was not me. They did not know who I was. They'd never spoken to me. Whoever was doing the anonymous calling to L and I is something, in my opinion, that is completely separate to what Rebound was saying. Rebound looked at the bid, and they said there are problems <coughs> with the way the city is doing their work. And they asked the auditor to look at it. The auditor is coming back to look at it. I understand that my opponent has told several people that they are not coming back, but we did have a Zoom call with them because we had been told they were, and it was confirmed that they are coming back. They will review it, and we will find out if there is something that the city needs to change. This was never an attack on Kurt Zander. It wasn't an attack on the golf course. It was merely a company that was looking into the practices of this city, and there have been many things. We've got lawsuits that we've lost. So we need to look at this for what it is. We want the city to run properly. We don't want to put ourselves in jeopardy. And that's what this rebound report brought up. And I welcome what the auditor has to say when they come back and look at it. And I think you'll find that at the end of the day, they too are going to say, this wasn't an attack on the golf course. We need to make sure that the city does their work correctly. That is what we are supposed to do as city council members. We're not supposed to be championing somebody who is having a problem with L and I. This is making sure that the city runs correctly. And that's what this is about. Thank you. Eric, do you have anything else to add? I'll give you a minute. Yeah. Um, I, I agree, but the rebound report, when I talked to Miriam and asked her the where she got the report and why she even did the report and her, and again, I wrote it in my blog, what happened and it was instigated, but not by Susan, but by somebody on the council. And that is not something that is helping the city. You know, what the city did with the contract, there wasn't any problems and I agree 100%. We need to have the oversight of what we do and what contracts do happen and by signing up Kurt and Turf Care to do the contract on the golf course saved the city $140,000. And that's the fact. And Kurt did it well, he did it right, he did everything he was supposed to do. The city had the oversight, and I'm not sure why this continues to still be going on, that we need to audit it again. All right, so I have one question for both of you. Do you both support City-owned golf course. I think we've been asked this now what five, six times. Of course. Uh, we haven't settled at the last one, but I guess not. So, <laughs> so that's that's a yes, correct? Both our records saying support and, the city. And we do have the uh, second phase of the irrigation project coming to us soon, very soon. Okay. And I think you'll find there'll be a unanimous yeah. vote for that. So yes. That was the second biggest question. <laughs> okay, moving on. Question number four. Susan, you've been on the council for a term, Eric, slightly less. During this time, what have you done regarding the freshwater situation? You have both identified our fresh waterways as a pri priority. What actions would you like to take during your next term if elected? Eric, you're first. 
You bet. Um, I actually started looking at the fresh waterways when I moved here uh, a long time ago because we took boat trips on the canals and stuff and saw that they needed a little help. Um, when I was on the planning commission with Jeff Daniel, we started addressing this specifically with our comprehensive plan when we started writing that, knowing we needed to deal with the fresh waterways and what that would take. Um, Jeff's first project with the fresh waterways was the North Grand Canal project. Um, when he passed away in January of 19, um, I kind of just headed it up and we had three charrettes. Um, we worked with all of the stakeholders that um, were involved with the uh, fresh waterways, whether it was uh, people who lived on the, on the waterways, the uh, fresh waterways board. Um, we had a consultant come in and we designed the, the park. Um, it should be coming out. I know Nick has had it for a while. It got stopped because of COVID. Um, and when I looked at the fresh waterways, it needs something done. You know, with, when they dug them out, they were just swamps and they want to go back to swamps. Um, there's a lot of issues. I would love to go deep dive into it. Oh, wait, ditch is a big issue that we need to deal with. But what it's going to take is all of the citizens coming together and deciding what is it we want to do with the fresh waterways. I have some ideas on what we could do, um, whether it comes to dredging, taking care of um, the weeds, um, taking care of not spraying as much as we, we are, and cleaning them up. It's going to take a lot of work. It's going to take a lot of money. A lot of things that this city had done early on in its um, beginnings was they would build stuff and then not have any reserves or any money to take care of it. Our roads, our walk, everything. So what it will take is, from my perspective, which I've been talking about for quite a while now, if we want to do it, we need to create potentially, you know, the, the waterways are part of our stormwater drainage system. Um, so that means putting it into the stormwater drainage. The Public Works Department has no stormwater drainage um, division at the moment. They just take care of it as they can, and we have a lot of issues with that. So it would be creating a department, probably putting three full-time people in there, probably um, getting whatever we need to get, whether it's a dredge, whether it's a you know, physical machine to take care of the weeds and everything, but what it is going to take is money. Um, that's just the fact. So what I would recommend and what I would do is take it out to a vote of the citizens and you all decide what you want to do. You know, it would be raising our stormwater rates. How much that would be depends on what the projects are going to be, but we need a long-term solution for the long-term that we won't come back to this 10, 20 years and go, what are we going to do with our fresh waterways? We need to address it now, and we need to address it permanently. And that's what I would, but I would not do it without taking it out to a vote of all the citizens. And if it goes through, great. If it doesn't, then so be it. Thank you, Eric. Susan. So this is great. I don't have to say anything else because Eric said it all. I'll just add to it. So thank you for all that you've said because I agree with all of that. We got her we, we, <laughs> we, we have. We have, though, in this particular situation, yes, it has to be a long-term plan. What Eric was referring to was that there was a grant given to the city back in 1995-96 for a biofiltration uh, system to be put in at the north end of the Grand Canal. And once it was put in, it wasn't maintained. And some of you will nod your heads and say, yes, that's what we do in this city. And so now we're faced with that issue that uh, Eric made mention of. We have money set aside for the upgrade to the Integrated Aquatic Vegetation Management Plan. It's taken me a long time to be able to remember that entire statement there. It is a next step in what we need to do. We are waiting for Public Works to get that up for us so that we know what that's about. But we heard from, I did a, a forum because I thought citizens really wanted this to, to happen. They want the city to do something. Bob and Carol in the audience have gathered almost 800 signatures on a petition to ask the city to do something. And because it didn't look like we were going to do anything for a while, I thought I'd hold a forum in this room. It was filled as it is tonight. And everyone got to listen to Peter Jordan, who has been here for many, many years. And one of the things he said that we need to be very careful and conscious about 
was that they were working and getting plans to do something to fix it. And along came Fish and Wildlife and they said, uh -uh, you don't get to do it like that. And so what I would like to say is that if we are going to do anything at all, I'd like to get the agencies in here first, having the discussion with us, so that we know when we come up with really exciting plans that it's something they're going to approve. When they looked at it back in Peter Jordan's day, they thought they would use grass cart. And I, forgive me, the numbers are not correct, but they said that they would need something like 56,000 grass cart. But when it came down to it, they couldn't afford it. They only had 26,000. But when Fish and Wildlife came along, they said you can only have 2,500. And 2,500 grass cart did not do the job. So we need to be sure when we do it this time that we do it right. It will be an increase in fees. And it is something that everyone has to think about. And it will be something that I will continue to do as I always do. We will have our weekly community forums. We should hold a town hall. We should get everybody's input. And we should continue to work with the Fresh Waterways Advisory Board and the corporation who've been doing the work all along. Those conversations should be ongoing and we will do that. And I know that we have the support of the entire council again on this one particular issue. We just need your support in terms of what it's going to cost. Thank you. I, I do have one quick topic. Go ahead. Um, we have actually talked to Fish and Wildlife and Ecology very recently with the uh, putting the plan of the suction dredge that we were looking at, and they both were amicable to that happening. They just said it's going to take a lot of paperwork and a lot of money, but they were, they did not say no, and they said they could probably work it through. Thank you. Quick rebuttal back. Thank you for that, Eric. Again, I would like everybody in the room together so that we can all have that conversation rather than hear it. It might be or it might not be. So, yeah. Great. Thank you both. All right. Question number five. The word transparency continues. <laughs> Seems the city has received COVID funds, and yet the general public, including needy businesses and nonprofits, have heard nothing. As two sitting council members, how do you align that with transparency? And what is happening with distribution or the use of those funds? And how do you think the funds should be used? Susan. It's a complicated question. Then you can get them to do it. It's a pure so, thank you, Eric. We figured out how to answer the question together. We've actually done good work together on our ad hoc committees. So Wait, that's two in a row. <laughs> okay, go ahead. On this particular one, this, this was the original CARES Act funding that came to the city. And there were several council members that wanted to have the money go towards businesses to help them. It did not. But every penny was accounted for that came in. There were separate line items that that was done. It came out to the exact penny, if I remember correctly, that it was all accounted for. In terms of transparency, everything was put there so that you could see it. The problem with this city is that sometimes you don't know how to go and find it. We just had this conversation about the budget the other day. Somebody asked me for something. So, well, how do you get there? How do you find it? It's very complicated. As candidates, we've actually had the ability to ask the mayor questions rather than go and look it up. And she's been very good about giving us the, the response. Except that today when I asked her something as a council member, and she didn't give it to me, she just said, you can go look it up yourself. But as candidates, we were able to get some information. We do have ARPA money. We have $900,000 that we've received so far. We have not decided yet how that is going to be spent. My understanding is that we have a study session coming up at our next council meeting so that all council members can decide. And I would encourage you all, tell us how you would like us to spend that money. Just because it's coming to us from another organization doesn't mean that you don't have an opportunity to discuss this with us. Where does it need to go? Who needs the help? And that's what we need to know. That's why we have to have these conversations and have you be part of it. When we do study sessions, we don't usually have public comment, but you can reach us at any time. Transparency to me is being available and being open. 
You can email me, you can come to my meetings, we can meet somewhere. COVID was difficult, we did everything via Zoom, but Zoom works as well. The funds should be used to help whoever needs it. In the CARES Act funding, we actually paid ourselves back. I believe it was for some of the unemployment. And so the city came out of this looking really good because we used the money ourselves. I don't believe we need to do that this time. We have plenty of money in our coffers. I would like to see this money used where it needs to be, for the businesses if they need help, maybe for the hotels if they need help. But again, we haven't had the discussion yet, and we are open to hear what people need and how we can actually spend the money to the best of the, uh, for the community at large. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Yeah, um, I agree. I mean, we, you know, from my perspective, we were pretty transparent. I mean, there was a little bit of frustration early on on how that money was being used, and we asked a lot of questions on what it was being used for. Um, it was shown quite a bit of it, which I am ecstatic about, was used to feed the community um, with the meals from the convention center that went to um, homebound people that couldn't leave because of COVID. And I thought that was probably one of the best uses we could use for that money. Um, it was also used for PPE, but it was, it is all transparent. This, uh, for me, this gets a little frustrating because it continues to come up. We're not transparent, I'm not transparent. Everything we do is transparent. We cannot do things that are not transparent. All the paperwork, all the uh, council meetings, um, this has been talked about a number of times at our council meetings about where the money was spent, how it was spent. Um, the mayor has put it all out there and, and you know that and accounted for all of it. So I would encourage you, you know, to call call us, you know, call the council members. Where did this money go? How was it spent? We will find that out for you. That's what we're here for. Um, I agree, that's what the transparency is. Ask me a question and I will do the best I can to answer it. Uh, I have never not done that. Um, and I've always said, please call me. I'd be much better on a phone or face-to-face -face or just ask the question as opposed to getting the information somewhere else and then hearing a rumor that this didn't happen and all of a sudden that's the fact is we weren't transparent because I heard from this, from that, from this instead of just asking the people that are involved in it what happened to it and here's what happened to it. But we've been very upfront with that money. Um, we are excited and we have, for the ARPA money that's coming in, I think we have like three or four years to spend it so it's not like there's this tight time frame and it has to be used for very specific things also economic development those kind of things um, so there are a lot of strings to this money when it comes in on what it can be used for um, we can't just put it in the general fund and use it for whatever we think we can use it for it had to be COVID related um, and it had to be accounted for and it all was so um, as far as transparency ask and I will always do the best I can to find out the correct answers. Great. Thanks for that. That clears up some rumors, I think. Well, hopefully. All right, question number six. Several years ago, council voted to hire a lead planner to address the permitting and ordinance enforcement issues identified by the public. A person came, a person came and went. Why is this position still vacant? issues persist. What is your plan to address this? It hasn't been addressed at council meetings. Eric, your first question. Yeah, um, I was ecstatic when we actually put in the budget a few years ago for a lead planner. Um, the city has been hurting for quite a while um, without a qualified lead planner. Uh, part of the issue is finding that qualified person is not easy. Um, I, I I was frustrated also when that plant, that position was not um, put out there. The, the, my understanding from the mayor why she didn't, she was concerned about COVID and the effects that that was going to have on the city. So as the lead planner had stepped out, she didn't want to fill that position to try to save money in case something came up with COVID. Um, I would rather that position does get filled. I do know that um, one of the public works gentlemen, Marshall, has stepped into that position that Alicia held um, when she retired, and he is doing a much better job of trying to hold, especially in the lot clearing. Um, I think he, he had a lot of backlog he had to pick up. 
Um, but I do feel that we need a lead planner that can really work with the council, work with the citizens, work with the city, especially in this environment of, you know, where we're at now and the boom that we tend to be going through. The other part of the um, planning issue is that we have been working on, and Susan and I work very well together on the ad hoc that she mentioned earlier on the comprehensive plan, because our zonings and ordinances are so out of date, written back in the 70s and 80s, and very few of them have been updated. Specifically, our pyramid zoning makes it very difficult on any, on especially a lead planner, because you, as you've seen with some of our condition, conditional use permits that have been approved lately, we allow anything, anywhere with our pyramid zoning. Until we get that zoning figured out, which the Planning Commission is currently working on, it's going to be difficult to really grow this city the way it should be grown. Um, and we need a lead planner to do that. I would be, um, I think we should push it for sure next year. We need to fill that position. Um, but I do know it's going to be difficult because you don't just find those people. They're very specific. They're highly trained. They need to know what they're doing. Um, and they're not easy to find. But Ocean Shores is a good place, so hopefully we can attract somebody. But I would be filling that position, hopefully by next year. Thank you, Eric. Susan? Got a slightly different perspective. It's something that I've spoken about for many years. I believe one of the problems that we have now dealing with our growth is the fact that we do not have a planning director. And I believe that's what we need to have. Having a lead planner is fine to sort of scurry around and take care of what's happening. But I believe we need a planning director to look to the future. Where are we going from here? And are we just going to continue doing it the way we are? And given the comments that I received from people, you don't want it to go the way it's going. We need to get a handle on this and manage our growth so that we do it properly. A lot of concern comes from citizens saying, is our infrastructure sound to be able to continue with this building? I can tell you that we have been told by Public Works, absolutely that is true. We were platted out in the beginning for a number of lots. We were, we were platted for full build out, and our infrastructure is built the same way. The concern I would have is that it's now 50 years old, and we need to be paying attention to that infrastructure, particularly our water pipes and so on. In terms of not being able to get people to come to the city, I disagree with that too. I think we don't make a concerted effort to find these people. We did have a lead planner. He came and he worked and he was very good. But he couldn't do the things he wanted to do because our whole system wasn't allowing him to do it. We had a second code enforcer that we had for a while who was helping to work on some of these lots. And he couldn't do that either. There seems to be pieces that are broken in the system that need to be fixed. We need to step back from it, look at it comprehensively. If we can hire a planning director to help us move, we can get lead planners. We can get a handle on this. We do have that position filled by Marshall. He is going out and he is taking care of many of these lots. He is telling people to do it correctly. But there is so much building going on that it's really hard for him to get a handle on. We have our building inspector who is going to retire at the end of the year, and we're going to be in a situation where we've got to do something about that as well. We need to step back and look at the big picture. We tend in this city to say, oh, why don't we hire an assistant? I think we're past that. We need to be looking at those positions that we've taken away during the recession. When we didn't have any money, we cut off the top. Now we need to look at putting back those positions and then hiring the people underneath. We have to get a handle on what's going on. We need to continue to grow, but we have to do it properly. And that's my belief that we could do it that way. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. All right, question number seven. So the comp plan has been described as the city's vision plan. Is it portraying your vision of the city's plan? If yes, tell us about it. If not, how does your vision differ? Include your thoughts about affordable housing and homelessness. Susan? Do we get longer than five minutes? <laughs> of course we do, because we're running ahead of time. Good. Good. So I have a plan. 
problem with our comprehensive plan. Not the work that we've done, but the planning commission's work. I was on the planning commission when we first began the comp plan. And I asked if we were going to do a town hall on the vision of our citizens. And I was told, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to create the comp plan and give it to the citizens and ask them if they like it. Because they don't know what the vision is. So we're going to have to do the work. And I think that's incredibly arrogant. I think you guys are perfectly capable of doing that. I think we missed the boat by not having that visioning process at the beginning of the comp plan. We can still do it, and I hope that we do. We went through the planning commission. It came to the council. We have all worked very hard on this comp plan. It is important. It is a vision for the future. It's also something that we base our budget on. When we make our decisions, they should be in line with the comp plan. Is it my vision of the future? Many of you don't like it when I say this, but the vision of this community should be your vision, not my vision. I'm on the city council to serve you. We've never had the conversation. What is it that we want this city to become? We have these discussions all the time. Well, it's a retirement community. It's a tourist destination. It's everything. But one of the things that's happened recently is we have more and more people who live here full time. And not just retired people who are happy in a rocking chair, retired people who want to be part of this community. And that's a good thing. And more and more are coming out and they're coming to the forums, they're coming to these kinds of debates because they want to be a part of what's going on in the city. It has to be thriving. We need it to be a happy place. When you come into town, you want to see, at least I do, the beautiful flags that are out. We talk about the flowers, but well, we can't have flowers because the deer will come and eat them. Well, isn't there something else that we can do? You go to all of the places along the coast when you drive up, and it's so welcoming when you come in. And that is one of the things I think we're really lacking, and I would hope that we can actually start doing that a little bit more. We're seeing more and more businesses get involved in that now. Affordable housing and homelessness. Our big problem is workforce housing. Some of our homes are still affordable for people to buy, but they're certainly not anywhere for our workers to live. And that is the biggest issue that we face right now. We've all seen that. People can't get anybody to work in the business. They're not working in the business because they have nowhere to live. And that is the most important thing that we have to address. And how do we do that? We're going to have to have some really deep conversations about that. We need to encourage investment coming into ocean shores. We had an opportunity, it was called an opportunity zone, and we could have done that. It was from the federal government. We could have done an opportunity zone financial portfolio, but we didn't. We need to do these things. I'm not sure how the homelessness issue ties into our vision, but I can tell you that since I've been on this council, I have asked the council repeatedly to address this so that it didn't get away from us. <coughs> we are now in a situation where the state legislator, le legislature told us what we have to do. And it isn't pretty. We have to allow emergency shelters in any area where we allow a hotel. Yell. There are ways to get around it, but unfortunately, we cannot in this city. We're not big enough, and we don't provide the transportation in the areas. The permanent supportive housing and transitional housing can be allowed in any area where there is a residential zone. So what we have to do and what we are doing is working on how do we control that, because we can to a certain extent. But there are certain rules that we can't go beyond we can't make it so difficult that they can't locate here. But it's a, something that is so important that you have a conversation, that you don't catch from the supermarket and say, what is this? The city is building a homeless shelter? No, we weren't building a homeless shelter. We were having a conversation. We created our ad hoc committee so that we could look at the rules and the regs. But what we need is more interaction with our citizens so that you don't stand back and say, the city is making the wrong decision. We're making decisions now based on what the state legislature came out with in the last session. And we need to be looking at that, and if they're not working, 
We need to ask you to lobby the state legislators as well. It's not just coming here local. It's starting from the state. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. By the way, we gave you five minutes there, so Eric, you got five minutes too. Yeah. Surprise. Um, yeah, so, so the, the, the comp plan, and I've actually been working on this for a long time, since my time on the planning commission. Um, again, and the plan, at that time, when we started working on it, what we were trying to do was, we saw that the old comp plan was vastly outdated, and it drives ordinances and everything else. Um, if the city ever went into a boom, we were talking about at that time, specifically with some of the areas in the south end, we need to be ahead of it and have a comprehensive plan that will help address the build out of those areas. Unfortunately, the boom happened before the comp plan got completed. We have rough, roughed it out in a, you know, um, the draft is done that we do want to come out. I agree we should have a town hall. Um, I disagree that the public did not have comment on the the, the document during the planning commission, which was always open to the public. We had a huge amount of public interaction with the comp plan and people coming in, discussing it, and looking at it. The comprehensive plan is a sort of vision for the city. It's, you look at it as a 30,000 foot look at the city. So it is not a specific document on how you're going to build your buildings, what the, what the streets are going to look like, what the signs are going to look like. All it does is it define um, where the zoning is and actually doesn't even you know specifically design the zoning. Um, the main thing with the comp plan that people don't understand is the main person that uses that comp comprehensive plan is the city examiner. So when somebody comes in and they want a conditional use permit of a housing shelter, a homeless shelter, or um, they want to put a triplex on a residential lot that only allows a single family. The only document that that person, the hearing examiner looks at is the comprehensive plan. And in that comprehensive plan, if it allows you to do that, then he allows it. Case in point is those three houses that had over a hundred and some odd people against those things happening and he still allowed it because our current comprehensive plan allowed that to happen. The new comprehensive plan would help reduce that with our zoning and redoing the zoning and all of those, you know, so a city is a city. Um, you know, it's, every city has a comprehensive plan and I think if you looked at this comprehensive plan, most people would say, yeah, that makes sense. It's a common sense document. Um, we worked hard on it. We had a lot of input on it when we were working on it. I think we've come up with a very good document that it, um, when you all get to look at it, you will go, that makes sense. And then out of that comprehensive plan then comes the specifics of the ordinances on what the city should look like. And by all means, there should be town halls on those. You know, when it comes down to what are we gonna do with Point Brown and the corridor and that kind of stuff. But what I would see is a, what we were looking at with the comprehensive plan is having a business corridor. So the Point Brown Street, you can't put, you know, gas station or things like that on down the road. Um, but it's a it's a business district, and you have service districts, and you have hotel districts, and you're residential. So it's just defining the city more. It's not necessarily a vision for what it is. It's defining it so that it's a little bit more controlled with things that are happening right now. Um, as Susan said earlier, you can pretty much do build anything anywhere in Ocean Shores right now, and that's a problem. Um, so hopefully we can move this forward quickly. Um, and again, I encourage everybody because the Planning Commission is the one that does the legwork on all of these things. We didn't write it, it was the Planning Commission that wrote it. And their meetings are open, and I'm sure Greg is enjoying me <laughs> encouraging you to go to their meetings. And that's where you can have input. And we listened to a lot of people that had a lot of input um, on what it would be and what it should be. So. Um, it's not my vision of the city, it's not any specifics, you know, as a city council member, we're only here three years, four years, two terms, but then we move on. What is the city gonna look like 20 years from now, 50 years from now? That's what we're trying to look at. Um, when people are moving in, what are the specific buildings and, you know, I mean, you know, how tight do you wanna get? If you look at the city of Leavenworth and what they went through, it was not a pleasant experience for them. But is Leavenworth a pretty cool place? I'm sure. Would I ever wanna go through that? No. 
um, it was it was rough for them. But they came up with a really nice city, but um, it was a hard thing to do. Um, including affordable housing, I agree. We need affordable housing. I've tried to hire people. It took a long time to hire one housekeeper. I used to get a lot of people in Ocean Shores and Ocean, Ocean City in the area. It took me six months, and she commutes from Central Park. There's a huge problem with trying to find people who work in the service industry right now. Um, I think the ARPA funds might be able to do something, and I think a huge th thing is to partner with the tribe. They own all of Hogan's Corners. Is there some because they have the same issue we do with trying to, you know, staff their casino? So we need to partner with people to look at what it is. Are we going to be able to do it here in Ocean Shores? Um, you know, you can ask a developer to build low-income housing, but if he can build an apartment building that's going to get $1,500 a month rent, as opposed to us forcing him to build an apartment for $500 a rent, you're not going to get them to do that. You know, that's a very difficult thing to do, is try to dictate to um, contractors what they can build. Um, we can do that, but good luck trying to find them. So there needs to be a very creative way. Um, you know, I think there's there's some ideas out there, and I think if we work together, we can we can figure it out. But it's going to be tough for affordable housing and homeless. You know, we partner with the county. We don't have the services here. Thank you, Eric. Question number eight, and our final question. You have each made campaign promises. Tell us your top three most important campaign promises and report on your progress towards those goals. Eric, you're first. Do you have my promises written down? <laughs> <laughs> um, I made commitments. I don't know about pro I, you know. I, I, promises. I, I have priorities. Um, obviously, I I, I see um, Ocean Shores as a pretty Cool place to be. My, what my one priority, you know, if I get elected in the next four years, the things that I would like to work on cannot get done in four years, but we can set them up so that they are moving forward so in five, 10, 20 years they get done. My one, my first priority is the fresh waterways. I think that that is a priority. I think we need to work on that. Um, none of them are more important than the other ones. They're just three things. I would like to see us move forward with while um, I'm on the council. The second one is Point Brown and the sidewalks and how do we do that? And that takes a lot of interaction by a lot of people. So it, that one, you bet everybody needs to have input. Um, the way it was it happened before, I didn't agree with so much. I think there needs to be input from the citizens first. What would you like to see the downtown corridor look like? And how do we, um, fashion that with sidewalks and things. It, it is not having sidewalks on that point from corridor is a safety issue. It just does not, we need to do something about it. It also implied, you know, we have to work with the businesses because that was a huge thing the last time that the uh, sidewalks were being designed was um, after the fact the designs came up and the businesses balked at that hugely because they were losing a lot of their parking on Point Brown. We have to address that with the businesses, that they need to have parking, and I think we can do that. Um, parking off of Menard, where the people can park in a parking lot, walk across the Point Brown. We can park on Seashore, um, but it means taking care of the Oi Hut Ditch. That, you know, the Oi Hut Ditch is not a very, you know, sexy project to work on. It's the main ditch coming from Oi Hut down Point Brown to the Grand Canal. That's what feeds all of our waterways. That's what. If, if we don't fix that ditch that has never been taken care of, it's we have, we have an issue right now where our lumber is crumbling and we have to, they have to fix that. Um, but it's a place where we could then culvert, pave over, and put parking there that would help drastically for the businesses with that whole Point Brown corridor. Um, and then probably one of the more important things is our public safety. That bar none was the number one thing on the survey that we, that we put out asking the citizens what they want the city to be. We need a new police station, desperately. We need to make sure that the police are funded and given the resources that they need. I know, you know, when one of those resources came up at the council meeting not too long ago, um, and it was paid for mostly by a grant, and I'm still confused why my opponent voted against that with the uh, fingerprint machine that made everybody's jobs so much easier. 
um, we need the South Fire Station going. But those are going to, again, take money. I would, they need to go out to a vote of the citizens. But our fire department, they run eight calls a day. They're busier than most Seattle fire departments are. They are now having to run their ambulances to Olympia, Chehalis. They can't stop at Grace Harbor because Grace Harbor can't take a lot of them. It's putting a huge burden on our firefighters um, and our whole system. And how do we, you know, we need to support them. We need to fund them. We need to get the South Fire Station open so that we can get our fire ratings down for that South End. Um, I would say, you know, that's one that we can do is the police and fire, you know, the Point Brown and the canals, those are going to be long-term projects. But if we can move forward on those three that they are moving, I would be happy to camp. Great. Thanks, Eric. Susan? When I was elected, I did make a promise. And that promise was that I would listen to you. And four years I've done that. We tried to add up how many community forums and town halls I've done and came up to about 200 at least during the last four years. When we talk about priorities, it rather depends on all of you and what you see as a priority. We started out talking about the fresh waterways and the petition that was out. This is a big ticket item right now. It's hot. During the first part of my sitting on council, it was the roadside spraying that was really important to everybody. So what I'm going to say to you is that my promises, my commitments are simple. I will continue to listen to you. I will continue to hold my forums, town halls when we need to, because I still haven't been able to convince this administration that they're a good idea. I will continue to hold the administration's feet to the fire. We cannot keep doing business as usual. We have far too many lots that have been cleared, and we need to enforce our ordinances. Listening, holding the administration's feet to the fire, and enforcing our ordinances. And that just really covers everything. We need to look at our infrastructure. It's the most important thing that you talk to me about. You really don't come and talk to me about fresh waterways before you've asked me about whether or not the roads are going to stay in good condition. We've heard just recently from people that trucks are driving up and down Dolphin. And the concern of the lady was, what if these roads deteriorate and the city comes along and says, there has to be an improvement district and we have to pay for it? And it wasn't our fault. It was trucks driving when they should not have been. So in all, we have to look at what it is that you want. And the only way I know that is when I listen to you and we have a conversation. When it comes to the council, the interesting thing is that we hear from you. There are a couple of council members that have meetings. We hear from you. We discuss it on the council. We have our department heads who are advising us. And we make a decision. And 50% of you think that I am mad and marvelous because I voted exactly the way you wanted me to. And the other 50% thinks that I'm a complete dope. Why would I have done that? But the good thing is that at the next council meeting, when I make a decision, it flips. And what happens over the course of four years is that you can all say that I have done a really good job for all of you making the best decisions that we can make with the information that we have at hand. And that's another thing to remember. When we halted the roadside spraying, the only reason we did was because we had conversation with all of you. You were doing research, and you were coming forward and saying, what you're spraying out here is detrimental to us and to the environment. Well, they didn't know that in the beginning. That's why they did it. We can make the changes, and we have to. We have to be willing to change. As our demographics change, we have to be willing as council members to listen to a different dialogue. And we may be making different decisions based upon the new people that are coming in and the needs and the desires of them. It's not a stagnant position. It's the reason why we have to listen to you all the time. We don't just get elected because you think that we're great and then we don't have to listen anymore. The most important thing, and I will say it again, 
I promise you that I will continue to listen to what you have to tell me. And when I make decisions on the council, it will be because I've heard from you and I'm making the best decision that I can make at that particular point in time. Thank you. Great, thanks. So that concludes our questions. You guys ready for your closing statements? All right, Eric, you wanna go first? You guys decide who wants to go first. You get this time. All right, Susan wants to go first. No. Those cards are to be filled out, and then we can give those to the candidates. And they will answer you directly. You're welcome. I'm sorry, Jeff, I didn't hear that one. Uh, she wanted to know about the cards. Um, we're not going to ask the question. We're going to give the cards to you, and then you can answer that uh, person directly. Okay. Yeah, there's just not enough time to ask. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to have a conversation about issues that are important to both you and me. This forum has been important especially when a lot of false and misleading statements have been shoved in the faces of voters thus far in this election. But the truth comes down to one thing. Do you re-elect an independent thinker with a proven track record, who holds the administration's feet to the fire, who seeks public input, does her homework, asks questions, weighs the details, speaks clearly and honestly, or do you elect someone who simply rubber stamps what the mayor wants? Do you choose a candidate who cares about our entire community? Or do you choose the candidate whose sole platform has been to save a golf course that never actually needed saving? When my opponent was asked why he abandoned his current seat and chose to run against me, he never said he was passionate about serving you. His initial response was, she talks too much, and asked too many questions. My opponent had no more municipal experience than I did when I took the seat. The difference between us is not only did I ask questions, lots of them, in order to learn about the territory, I took advantage of the numerous training opportunities. I earned the Advanced Municipal Leadership Certificate. I continue to host town halls, weekly community forums, and I invite guest speakers to share their expertise. This month, we hosted the presentation and the discussion on the fresh waterways with over 50 people in attendance. I hosted our state legislators for legislative updates. And most important, I partnered with you on community projects like Project Connect and recently Neighborhood Watch that continue to bring benefits to all. We must hold the administration's feet to the fire. It's your money that we manage and spend. We must do it wisely. I'm proud of our accomplishments, our shared values, excited for the future, humbled by the trust you've placed in me and by the partnerships we have forged during these past four years. Thank you for allowing me to serve you and to be your voice. Thank you for your vote on November 2nd. I am Susan Canari, position number one, and I am proud to serve you. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Eric. Yeah, so I just want to give you my perspective of this election and what it seems to be about. Um, my opponent, I'm not sure where, the, what did you say I said? She speaks too much. I don't ever remember saying that. I actually go to my blog, voteracumble.com. I wrote a blog about why I was running for seat one. But when I moved here seven years ago, um, and I was going around the city, um, I started hearing a narrative of how broken the city was, how corrupt the mayor and the council was, and how bad the city was doing. Seven years ago, I was hearing about how horrible things were. And I actually kind of bought into that and looked at it and said, oh, um, one of the first people I met when I came to Ocean Shores was Susan. Um, one of the first conversations I had with Susan was about the city and what condition this city was in. 
Um, I was actually over at her house for quite a while, and she was showing me the city had a $30 million budget, and the mayor was misspending, and how atrocious everything was in this city. And I bought into it. The first mayor's election in 2015, 16, that Susan ran, I actually voted for Susan because I was like, oh my gosh, this is horrendous. What are we going to do? So I decided I need to find out what is this? What is going on? So I started going to the council meetings and I started looking at what was going on. I, I attended almost every council meeting for quite a while. Yes, the uh, Paperwork is hard to find, but I could find the budget, and I could see what was going on, and I started really looking into it, and what I started seeing was not what I kept hearing about a broken, corrupt city or a broken and corrupt mayor. I actually saw the exact opposite. 2007 and 2008, the city was almost bankrupt. It didn't have a dime. Hard decisions had to be made, and the mayor made a lot of tough, tough decisions. Um, when we moved here in 2014 and looking into it, it was just starting to come out of that recession. Um, and it took a long time and a hard, hard work. And the, bu ballot, the budget had been balanced. And I'm like, it doesn't look broken, it doesn't look corrupt. Is the mayor a perfect person? Far from it. She doesn't talk a whole lot. She holds things close to the vest. You know, um, what's interesting is, when I get called the mayor's puppet, I think one person called me a dingler sycophant. I've been called so many things, it isn't even funny. Um, but I don't even talk to the mayor. I think my opponent probably talks to the mayor more than I do. I don't even know what she stands for. Uh, I rubber stamp the mayor is a little odd when, if you look at almost all of the votes that have happened over the last three, four years, all, anything of consequence was seven and zero. So why isn't Susan in the mayor's pocket just as much as I'm in the mayor's pocket? Um, you know, that narrative of a broken and corrupt city is still going on to this day. I hear it over and over and over, how corrupt the mayor is, how corrupt the council is. Oh, but it's only part of the council, not all of the council. And that narrative continues to go on and on. If you continue saying things that aren't true long enough, people believe it. I think part of the division in the city is that narrative that divides this city into the city is corrupt, I'm corrupt. I've been called corrupt so many times it's not even funny. Actually, I was called corrupt at the last election on a Facebook post that Susan liked that thing. We were out at the mailbox and I called her out and I said, you know what that means when you call me, you like a post that says I'm corrupt. Do you think I'm corrupt? Do you know what that means? And all she said is, oh, don't worry about it, this is all a game. To me, this is not a game. This is real, this is you, this is the city. The city right now is in better financial shape than it's ever been in, I think, since it started. We have $4 million in the general fund right now. It's doing well. It is not broken, it is not corrupt. Have mistakes been made? Of course. Did the bad thing, was that a big mistake? Of course it was. Do we all wish it didn't happen? Of course we do. None of us had anything to do with that. that. That's on the mayor. But the city is not broken. For the people who continue to call me out on so many things, but have never had a conversation with me, shame on me. I will have a conversation with anybody. I will talk to anybody. This election is about trying to bring the city together and quit making it a divisive city. We need to move forward. And yes, we need to have Lots of talks with lots of, I will have every town hall, I agree. And I know my opponent has had all of those conversations, all those things, all those forums, but I still don't know what she stands for. You have to make a decision at the end of the day to move the city forward, and that's what I want to do. Thank you, Eric. So with that, we conclude. I appreciate everybody. Thank you, sir. Thank you.